may be seated. We're gathered here today to witness the sacred union of marriage. Alex and Melissa came here today as two people and somehow mysteriously will be leaving as one person. And personally, I've officiated a few weddings and this one has um, a particularly special place in my heart uh, for the love that I have for these two people, as you do too. And the fact that there aren't as many people as we originally anticipated here today uh, does not in the least bit diminish the meaning and the celebration. Because one of the persons who is watching is also mysteriously working behind the scenes in Alex and Mel, bringing them together, and that is Jesus Christ. But in order to officially begin the ceremony, we have to give the daughter away. So, Dad, who gives this woman to be with this man? More than I do. Small talk before the ceremony begins right here. Well, to begin with, it's important to understand that marriage isn't a man-made idea. It was and is God's idea. And we know that by going all the way back to the beginning. So we're going to go back quickly and I'm going to briefly talk about the first wedding in Eden. So I'll begin with Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone which is significant because it's the first time in the act of creation that God said something is not good. The Hebrew meaning for the word good actually means it works. It's functioning like it's supposed to. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And the pattern that we see up to this point in creation is God creating something and then affirming it by saying it's good. It's working like it's supposed to. Until he gets to the sixth day after he created everything and created Adam and he scans creation and he sees Adam alone and says that's actually not good I need to do something about that so the next verse tells us God's solution he says I will make him a helper fit for him now Adam wasn't actually alone at this time uh, and so we hit the rewind button and see uh, that there were actually animals with him in creation. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Now the ancient Hebrew reader in reading this would have known that this was a tremendously generous act of God. He was inviting Adam to rule, to be a vice regent over all of creation, to rule with him, because the act of naming something is actually an act of authority and power. But what we see in this passage is that power alone for humanity isn't enough. The next sentence tells us what was missing, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Daniel Kidner says of this passage that man is a social being made for fellowship, not power. He will not live until he loves, giving himself away to another on his own level. A helper is a difficult word to translate in the Hebrew. I always think of, when I think of helper, I think of a, a dad building a deck and his little son walking along behind him with a little plastic hammer after the dad's already done the heavy lifting, daddy's little helper, but that's not even close to what this term helper means, means in scripture. In fact, in another place in scripture, this term helper is used to describe and to name God. The idea is that of a mirror image to man, a reflection. And a reflection is the exact image of the person looking into the mirror and also simultaneously the exact opposite. Eve is the mirror image of Adam. She was created to help him, not to be subservient, but to help him. Another being 
equal in power, but opposite in every way. Now everybody thinks when, when we get married, we think that we're the prize. And I've discovered something over the years of being married is one, I am more difficult to live with than I ever imagined. And if it wasn't for Kara, my life would be a shadow of what it is right now. And over the years, you two will discover the treasure that you have in each other, the gift that God has given you in one another. And your life will be, become something that it was never able to become apart from the other person. Melissa is a helper to you, making your life better, and you're a helper to her, making her life better. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man, which is the purpose of the father giving away the bride at the beginning of the wedding ceremony. It's a living parable, a reenactment of the Garden of Eden when God, our Heavenly Father, brought Eve to Adam. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. <clears throat> the night before our wedding, um, Kara met with her dad, and he asked her, like he asked way too many times leading up to the marriage, are you really going to do this? Are you really going to marry him? And I'll be asking that same question of my daughter, just to make sure. But after she said yes, with tears in his eyes, he said, there will be days that this is going to be really difficult. Don't you come back home. You're leaving and you're marrying him and he is your new home. And if you ever come back, tired and wanting to quit, we're always going to send you back to him. Kara's, a, Kara's dad is a man who takes scripture very seriously and he was teaching her this very passage in that conversation. And so to wrap this up, I want to speak to you two and then I want to speak to the people who are here witnessing this moment. Alex and Melissa, it is your responsibility to cleave to one another. God's design for marriage is for you to create, like I said yesterday in the prayer, a micro community, a new family. So while staying relationally connected to your extended families, which is important, you also are responsible to create new family traditions that are just yours. Kara and I got married November 23rd, 2002. It's the day that Ohio State University beat Michigan. <laughs> the third season, and then they go on to win the national championship. It was also the best day of my life. And the following Thursday, not for that reason, <laughs> but for what happened after the game, was the marriage. After that, the next Thursday was Thanksgiving, and we were immediately invited by God to consider what a new family tradition might look like together. You ought to consider new rhythms of life together. What time do you guys go to bed? I had a shocking revelation the first evening of our marriage when I went to lay down on my typical side of the bed, the right side, and Kara went to lay down on the same side. And I said, this is my side of the bed. This is where I've slept all my life. And she said, this is my side of the bed. And she won that argument. And it's actually taken me 18 years to get used to sleeping on the other side of the bed. When will you wake up in the morning? When is technology allowed? And when will you shut technology off and turn deaf ears to the world? How often will you have people over? This is going to be very important for you two because Alex is probably the most extroverted person I have met in my entire life. <laughs> and I love him for it. And Mel, I'm guessing, is introverted. So when will you lock your doors to the outside world and say it's just us tonight? These are all decisions that you'll have to make together. Nobody comes into a marriage with a list of rules and expectations for the other. You come into a marriage with open hands. This in part is what it means to cleave to one another. Now I want you to actually turn, take her right hand and you guys both turn and I want you to look at the people who are here with you. 
And I always speak to the people in attendance because in my understanding, you're not here as only witnesses to this covenant. You are active participants. Here's your role. Here's your responsibility. Your role is to be the loudest and most tenacious advocates and cheerleaders of anyone on earth for this particular marriage. That's your role in this. You are to pray for them. You are to verbally express to Alex and Melissa your joyful support of their marriage. Simply put, your witness of this covenant today requires nothing less than your wholehearted support in word and deed privately and publicly. So thank you for being here and committing to that. You guys can face one another again. We're about to exchange vows. And there's two things I want to say about these vows. Um, one is a quote from a pastor, Timothy Keller, who says, wedding vows are not a declaration of present love but a mutually binding promise of future love. A wedding should not be primarily a celebration of how loving you feel now. That can safely be assumed. So the vows that you're about to take aren't mere sentimental gush and adoration that you have for one another right now. If you don't have that, then we shouldn't be standing up here. I know you do, and we all know you do, but that's not what these vows are for. These vows are future-oriented. They're meant to be looked back upon. They're meant to be a stake in the ground that you can look back and remember this day when life gets a little bit harder. The second thing I want to say about these vows is that there's two aspects of this commitment that you're making. The marriage is the only relationship on earth, it's the only thing in all of the universe that is binded together by a double covenant, a double commitment, a double promise. You're making a covenant with God vertically and with one another horizontally. So in order to enact that double covenant, the first set of questions that I ask you, I'll ask you to look at me. And then the second questions or the second things that you repeat, you'll look at one another. So first, look at me and standing here representing God. Alex, will you have this woman to be your wife? If so, answer by saying, I will. Will. And will you make your promise to her in love and honor and all duty and service in all faith and tenderness to live with her and cherish her according to the ordinance of God and the holy bond of marriage? If so, answer by saying, I will. I will. Melissa, will you have this man to be your husband? If so, answer by saying, I will. And will you make your promise to him in all love and honor, in all duty and service, in all faith and tenderness, to live with him and cherish him according to the ordinance of God and the holy bond of marriage? If so, answer by saying, I will. Alex, as a token of your love and affection to give to your bride this day, do you have a ring? Sean, good man. Just, just give uh, Alex, just give him Mel's first. <laughs> so you've established this covenant vertically with God. Now I want you to stand and face each other. And as you are putting the ring on Melissa's left ring finger, repeat after me. I, Alex, take you, Melissa. I, Alex, take you, Melissa. To be my lawful and wedded wife. I do promise in covenant before God in these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow. In sickness and in health, so long as we both shall live. Melissa, as a token of your love and affection to give to your husband this day. Yeah, you sure do. 
That's an important part of the ceremony. As a token of your love and affection, do you possess a ring? As you're placing the ring on his finger, would you repeat after me? I, Melissa, take you, Alex. I, Melissa, take you, Alex. To be my lawful and wedded husband. To be my lawful and wedded husband. And I do promise in covenant. And I do promise in covenant. Before God and these witnesses. To be your loving and faithful wife. In plenty and in want. In joy, and in, sorrow, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health. as long as we both shall live. Well, Alex and Melissa have requested that communion be their first act together as a married couple, which is perfect because communion too symbolizes the vertical relationship that we have with Christ and the horizontal mystical union that we have with one another in Christ. So could I ask Duke and Kyle and Justin to come forward now to pass the elements, please? And as they are passing the elements, I will read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may pass the elements. So when you receive this, the way this works is you peel off the top part, and there is the wafer, the bread, if your hands aren't too cold. If you would take the bread now. And taking the bread, Jesus said, This is my body, which is for you. Would you receive the bread with me? And now you can open up the juice. It can be a little tricky. In taking the cup, Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Would you receive the cup with me? Duke, do you want to collect? Father, let me pray for us, and then there's going to be a, a song. Father, I pray for Alex and Melissa that you would spiritually enrich and bless them, particularly through this act of communion. In Jesus' name, amen. The song that Alex and Mel chose is He Will Hold Me Fast, and I'm going to invite you now to stand and sing with us. The lyrics are in the bulletin. When I feel my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would 
says in Ephesians 3, may God do in you and through your marriage far more abundantly than all that you could ask or think according to his power at work within you. And in the words of Moses, as he blessed Aaron in Numbers 6, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. By virtue of the authority invested in me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the presence of God and these assembled witnesses, I now pronounce you husband and wife, what God has joined together may no man separate. You may kiss the bride. Hey. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> 